So today, what we're going to go through is the basics of getting a Spring MVC plugin integrated with your .CMS installation. Um, we are a Spring MVC shop here at Ethode, and um, one of the great features we like in .CMS is the availability to use Spring MVC. Matter of fact, they also have OSGI integrated with .CMS. And um, the reason why we like OSGI is pretty simple. Let me show you the back end. Let me show you the um, the interface that we use for this. So those of you who are used to doing Java development, you're very aware that um, you know in order to get your new code out in order to deploy plugins on most systems that are Java. Uh, you wind up having to uh, restart Tomcat. Matter of fact, if you have multiple uh, web servers, if you run a cluster, you, you wind up having to go through quite a maintenance window. If you go to the back end of .CMS, you'll see dynamic plugins. These use OSGI. And OSGI allows you to deploy new code in a separate thread on top of uh, Tomcat or whatever web container you're using. And in this case, they integrate with .CMS and the core libraries. Um, you can see in this list here, exported packages, you can see all the different packages that are exported from .CMS to OSGI. These are all usable within your plugins. Um, in this list, you can see we have uh, Spring Framework uh, libraries. Um, you can use your own libraries um, unless there's a reason that you would want to use your own libraries. I would highly suggest just using the uh, Spring libraries that come with .CMS. They do uh, keep them somewhat up to date. Um, once in a while you will run into an issue where um, some of the newer features of Spring just aren't available. Um, so you would use your own um, your own jars in your plugin, which we can cover in a, a later tutorial. Um, for today, let's let's go ahead and go over to uh, .CMS here, and we're going to do one other thing. I'm not going to use the plugin that comes from the core here um, because our site's actually running on 257. So what I'll do is we'll go to core 2x and I'm going to choose the 257 tag there we go and under docs examples uh, OSGI they have several templates uh, for different types of plugins you could want to build so today what we'll do is we'll start with the spring plugin Um, each plugin does have a README. It is worth your time to read through these README's if you're not familiar with how their plugins work. Um, it is important to note that uh, some of these plugins do require um, certain special instructions in their activator. Um, or um, in their manifest, depending on how you're building, if you're building using OSGI uh, or Gradle. We're going to use Gradle today. And let's, before we download this plugin, let's also look at its contents here and talk about it real quick. So, I'm on, I'm on Mac, and uh, so uh, there is a bat here for Windows. Um, if you want to use Windows, uh, you will have to call this bat to build it using Gradle. Uh, if you're on Linux or OS X, you're going to use Gradle W. Um, Gradle, for those of you who aren't familiar with Gradle, Gradle is a replacement for Ant, if you will. And it allows you to specify your build using uh, syntax that is fairly similar to Java. Um, I don't want to get into a bunch of specifics on Gradle, mainly because you could you could do a series of 20 videos on Gradle alone. 
it would be worth your time to look up the basics of Gradle so you can understand a little bit of what's in these scripts. This particular method right here, jar, is a custom method that we created that we're going to be calling on uh, in our command line when we build this. Um, this is going to specify the version of Gradle to be used and when you call Gradle W it will download 1.8 for you um, and use it behind the scenes and uh, you'll see a little bit of that later. Um, you can see that we specify in here the activator. This is the class <coughs> The activator is the class that OSGI Framework will look for when you upload your plugin for the first time. That class are methods which control what happened during startup, during teardown, and during um, undeploy, etc. Um, let's go back. And let's look at some more source here. So you'll notice there's a resources directory, and there's an example servlet.xml. Um, and those of you who have used Spring, um, you don't have to have a special name for the, the servlet XML anymore. So, um, you know, I know five, six, seven years ago, there were people who, you know, you had to name this a certain, a certain way. Uh, it doesn't really matter anymore in Spring. The newer version of Springs, they don't care what you call it, um, and we're going to add it to uh, we're going to add it to the .cms activator anyways with whatever name we want to call it. So you can call this Spring hyphen servlet. You can call it uh, Fuzzy Bunnies. It it doesn't really matter. What does matter is inside here we specify our controller beans. So. Um, those of you who are familiar with Spring, you do know that you don't necessarily have to define your beans um, in here. You can use annotations. Um, and doing Spring inside of .cms, um, you still have the option to use annotations. These demo plugins just happen to use some XML configuration. So, um, you know, to not make this a long broadcast, we're just going to use it as is. But um, for those of you who are familiar, you can use the um, MVC context uh, and pull in those namespaces into this file up here. And you can tell .cms to, instead of using XML, um, scan different packages for uh, annotations that uh, specify your controller. Um, down here, this is extremely important, down here we have a view resolver. So this view resolver, for most of you, when you do your Spring application, is pointing to a specific directory, and it's also specifying the extension of the file itself. Uh, along with that, you also have a view resolver that you can use that comes straight from Spring. Now, those of you who have used .cms, let's look at the back end here real quick, just so you can put the two and two together. These folders here that you see, um, along with the documents inside of it, these don't actually exist per se. So there's no uh, directory structure that you can FTP into where you're going to see uh, what we do.html. Um, these are virtual files that are tracked in the database. Um, it, they do have some assets that are tracked on disk, but for the most part these are all virtual, which is why .cms uses WebDAV if you want to access certain things. Um, so what we'll see here, the reason why that's important is we have to have a custom view resolver that was created by .cms. Otherwise, all of your views would not be editable via the back end of .cms. You would actually have to edit those on the hard drive, and which is okay as a developer. It, it would be okay as a developer. Not optimal, but okay. 
um, it wouldn't be uh, easily deployable. It wouldn't work with the push publishing feature. Uh, but most importantly is if you have a dev team and then a UI team, your UI team, you don't want them to be connecting to the server and, and, and changing files like that. So this view resolver will actually allow you to take a path and an extension, and it will take that data and it will post it. Uh, well, it actually adds it to the request, uh, not necessarily a post, um, and it sends it to the appropriate file. So here in our application, we have application spring hello world, and you'll see in the example plugin, we have application spring .html, and in our controller, we'll specify the view hello world. So if we look at if we look at our code here, you can see in our activator, <coughs> you can see in our activator, we have our start method. We're initializing services, which is a .cms class that we're tapping into. Um, for now, don't worry too much about what goes on in here, but there are some services that start up with .cms that are quite important for all this to work together. Um, for the most part, all you really need to worry about is using their start method and their stop method. Um, of course, you can change the name of that XML configuration file, and you can even change uh, its location. I, I would highly suggest uh, using Spring inside Docimus for the first time to leave it exactly how it is. Once you have the plugin working and everything appears to be accurate, then you can go through and start to customize some of these things. Um, let's talk about a couple other things that are really important to understand. So CMS filter is a Java filter in .CMS. And those of you who maybe have not played with Java filters, I would highly encourage you to look up a couple resources and find out how they work. But essentially, we have a class in .CMS called CMS filter. This filter is in the web.xml web and it touches almost every page in the site. There are very few uh, URLs that it does not hijack. Um, and then from there, it will look to determine which virtual resource is being called upon, um, should it pull up a static file, etc. Um, so what we want to do is we want to tell the CMS filter that we have a spring controller or maybe multiple that we want to have our own URL for that .cms is not going to touch. So what we're going to do is we're going to say exclude from your processing rules this URL prefix. So everything that happens after app slash spring is not going to be touched by .cms's CMS filter. So that's big time important. Down here you also see we remove that. So when you undeploy this plugin using .cms, it will then tell .cms that, hey, you can have this URL context back. We're done using it. Uh, likewise, we unpublish the services that we published here. Uh, and then we also unregister the servlet itself. So and keep in mind that this is singular, but if your, um, if your XML has multiple servlets, uh, I mean, you or rather, if you have, yeah, anyways. All right, and let's look at, here we go, an example controller here. So this is gonna be fairly familiar to everyone. So we have um, enable web MVC configuration. We have our request mapping example controller. And then we have our controller annotation. Um, and, and really keep in mind guys that the controller annotation in this sense right now is not being auto detected to determine if it needs a bean or not. Um, but it's being read uh, during compilation and runtime uh, so that we don't have to extend um, you know all the different logic manually that we used to have to do with uh, Spring. 
Um, you'll also see that we have a hello world method which is tied to the slash. So if you recall, all of our URLs are going to begin with app slash spring. So therefore, in order to access this URL, you would type in app slash spring slash example controller slash. That would bring up this test method right here, and it would spit out to the view uh, using the variable message, the word, uh, rather the words right here in my message. And this is the name of the view that we're sending it to, hello world. And if you recall, we had a view right here, hello world.html. So let's, let's download this plugin, and let's go through the build process. And I already have this local, so rather than download it, let's go ahead and connect straight to it. And you, you can see I have a Core2x in here. Go to docs, examples, all right, so here we have a very basic example that you saw online. To build this example exactly how it is, all we're going to do is do Gradle W, and this is the important part, we have to specify jar. This is so we call the specific method that we saw in our Gradle build script. If we don't do this, A, it's not going to build correctly. Um, it's going to try to build a war. Uh, and then B, uh, we're not going to get our manifest file and our OSGI jar. And um, part of this jar method specifies all the different commands we need in our manifest. And uh, OSGI is dependent upon that manifest as its list of instructions. So this is why it's important to um, remember to use the jar here, otherwise you could spend hours wondering why nothing is working. Alright, that was painless. If we go into build, and then I believe libs, you can see we have now a uh, extremely small basic jar file here. So what we're going to do, so I'm going to go into our site, we'll go to dynamic plugins, and you can see we do have some dynamic plugins we, we've put in here. So we've put in here a Tucky plugin we use for handling 301 redirects from our old site to our new site. Um, we also have a plugin here from Isaac uh, which helps us to minify CSS into one nicely minified file. Um, and let's go ahead and upload this file. So you can see here we have this newly built spring file. And one more thing before we do this, let me show you one other thing. So, especially when you're developing in .CMS, it's important to use the logs properly. And using the logs, we can actually see the plugin deploy itself, any issues it may have, uh, any startup errors, etc. So we're going to upload that. doesn't look like we have any errors. It did deploy. And you can see it's using the, the name of the file there. And so if you remember, we should be able to do etho.com app spring example controller slash. <laughs> 